the first thing that I want to talk about are the difference be differences between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. There's a couple of big differences that we need to take into account when we're doing spectrum analysis. It's very important that we understand both of these differences. So let's start by talking about 2.4 gigahertz. If you see 802.11b, g, and n, then you know that that's probably a 2.4 gigahertz compatible device. And the 2.4 gigahertz wavelength is longer than the 5 gigahertz wavelength. So we see that it has a greater range. 2.4 gigahertz will go about 300 feet. Now, that's going to depend on a lot of things, the equipment you're using, the environment, how much stuff is around you, even to whether it's raining outside or not can affect range. So about 300 feet is what most vendors will say, what approximately you'll get with most 2.4 gigahertz wireless gear. In the five gigahertz band, the wavelength is much shorter. They're much closer together. So we see a lower indoor range. The signals attenuate faster, which means they get blocked easier uh, by things like walls and doors and windows and desks and filing cabinets and people. And so the result is that we only see a range, an indoor range of about 90 feet. So the range with the five gigahertz band isn't nearly as good. And back in the day when two wireless standards were, when two wireless standards were introduced, um, two brand new standards were introduced, uh, 802.11b and 802.11a were both introduced in 1999 at the exact same time on the exact same piece of paper. Now 802.11a could hit a nice fast data rate. It could hit 54 megabits per second, but 802.11b was limited to 11 megabits per second. But back then, Wi-Fi wasn't even called Wi-Fi yet. It was just called 802.11. And for the most part, it was being used for wireless barcode scanners and warehouses. So when people were comparing 802.11b and 802.11a and deciding which gear to buy, ultimately, they went for the standard that had a better range. They ended up going for 802.11b because it was cheaper, it didn't require as much equipment to deploy, and they didn't need the fast speeds of 802.11a. And we are still feeling the results of these events back in 1999, even today. Today, if you go out and buy a wireless device, it is going to support 2.4 gigahertz. Automatically, it will support 2.4 gigahertz out of the box. 2.4 gigahertz is universally compatible. Whereas the five gigahertz band sees limited compatibility. We don't have nearly as many devices that work in the five gigahertz band. Um, for example, there's a lot of inexpensive uh, Windows laptops and uh, inexpensive Android phones and tablets that don't support five gigahertz. If you look on the box, they're not gonna say 802.11a and they won't say 802.11ac. And if you don't see 802.11a or 802.11ac on the box, then you know it is not a five gigahertz compatible device. It is a single band device that only supports the 2.4 gigahertz. A good example of this is that in 2012, Google released a tablet called the Nexus 7. It was a budget seven inch Android tablet that sold for 199 brand new. And it was a phenomenal little tablet. I have two of them at home. It was a great tablet, but it was only compatible with 802.11 BGN, which means it was a single band device. Now in 2013, Google released a new model. They refreshed the tablet. They released the 2013 Nexus 7, which supported 802.11 a, B, G, N. So now it has a dual band radio. It can work both in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. So this is getting better. Um, pretty much every Apple device, starting with the iPhone 5, has a dual band radio on board. Even my old 2009 Mac Mini supports uh, 80211 A, B, G, N. So this is getting better and better over time. Since 2.4 gigahertz has been kind of the default band for so long now, it is highly congested with Wi-Fi. There are a lot of Wi-Fi devices that operate there. So there's just a lot of activity that, that we have to contend with, that we have to live with. And we're going to talk about that a lot more here in just a minute. It's also plagued with non-Wi-Fi interference. If 2.4 gigahertz is good for Wi-Fi devices, it's good for non-Wi-Fi devices as well. It's unlicensed spectrum, so anybody can operate anything there as long as they stick to a few basic rules. And the, a lot of people like the range, and that works well for things like uh, cordless phones, wireless video cameras, even microwave ovens use the 2.4 gigahertz band. And so we see a lot of non-Wi-Fi activity there. Perhaps the biggest problem is that there are only three channels that do not overlap in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Channels 1, 6, and 11 are the only three channels that don't overlap that we have to work with. Whereas in the 5 gigahertz band, we have 24 channels, 24 channels that do not overlap. And the, the amount of channels that we see here is completely to scale. The 2.4 gigahertz band is tiny 
compared to the five gigahertz band. And that's something that we need to be really careful about, something that we need to watch out for when we're trying to deploy a wireless network. So let's talk about the 2.4 gigahertz channels for a second. You may have been thinking to yourself, wait a second, Joel, wait a second. You're telling me that there's only three channels in the 2.4 gigahertz band? I, I know that there's 11. And some people might even say, well, I'm in Europe, there's 13 here. And, uh, and in Japan, there's even 14 wireless channels. What are you talking about? What do you mean there's only three channels? Well, here's the thing. The whole 2.4 gigahertz band, the usable space that we have for Wi-Fi in the United States is only about 60 megahertz wide. Now this is, now I'm, I'm generalizing quite a bit here, but it's about 60 megahertz wide. Each Wi-Fi channel is 20 megahertz wide. So when you do some basic math, you realize that there's really room for only three non-overlapping channels. We only have room for three channels that don't overlap, channels one, six, and 11. Now, why do they overlap? Well, when we look at how the channels are laid out, when we look at how the channels are laid out, we can see uh, we can see that channel one is 20 megahertz wide, and then to find when we and we go by the center of channel one, and to find channel two, we're going to go up five megahertz. So we're just going to go up five megahertz, and that puts us on the center of channel two. If we draw a box to show where channel two is we can see that it partially overlaps the channel one by about 75%. And that's really, really bad. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but that is really bad. And we want to avoid that at all costs. So the result is that we only get channels one, six, and 11, three non-overlapping channels to work with. And we want to stick with those channels as much as possible. Now, if you're in the European Union or other parts of the world, you may note that you have some extra channels available. So it's possible to squeeze another channel in there. You can get channels one, five, nine, and 13 as a four channel scheme in other parts of the world. But for the purpose of this, this webinar, I'm just speaking for the US today.